this material is really about the intersection of art and culture and how each one feeds into the other about how our uh, you know our, the creations in our entertainment feed our culture and our culture in turn creates more art and feeds the other way around it's this loop and all of a sudden you take a hatchet to the loop and you chop it in half and now you have to figure out how to begin to rebuild it um yet you see the role it plays in in a sort of functioning society and how it is important um, and if, if you disagree with that, then like, I don't know, it, it's weird. Cause it's like, don't you watch TV? Don't you watch movies? Well, there are people who don't, but, but, but are they watching this show? Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like if you're watching this show, like you should agree with this. friends to episode 215 of the ink to film podcast where we read the book and then see the movie i'm filmmaker james bailey and i'm writer luke elliott and this week we discuss patrick somerville's 2021 series station 11 all right we're five episodes in Mm -hmm. i can't wait to start talking about the show uh, but i really don't know where you're gonna land on it like i i'm excited to hear your thoughts are you sure you don't know (laughs) i feel like i have a good idea but but i've also seen you know we watched the five episodes, and then I have to do my research, and I hear some, I see some rumblings from people, and I was a little surprised. So I, I want to know where you where you stand on it. I'm floored. Uh, I'm loving this show. Um, I, I find it to be a beautiful, uh, sad, but not not wallowing show. I think the performances are incredible. Um, there's some absolute standouts that I'm excited to highlight, but. Um, yeah, you know, the music, the the visual storytelling that there is on display is incredible. And when we talk about adaptations, we we always are are looking at like what decisions these creators are making when they are transitioning mediums. I get the sense that they looked at this book and they said, "This thing's incredible. We all love it here, right? We're in the writers' room, <laughs> um, or even if it's just one person, I'm not really sure. But we love this thing. Yet." we are actually going to be telling a longer story that involves more in-depth look at characters, more side characters coming to the fore and creating 10 episodes out of, out of this book. And in order to do that, we have to look for areas within the narrative that could benefit from um, expansion. And you intro- introducing some new plot lines, many arcs, within an episode to uh, fulfill certain sort of narrative roles. In order to do that, I think they also made some changes that I think were good. I think there was some smart shifts. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some of the significant ones um, here soon when we actually get into our episode by episode discussion. But I think they looked at each opportunity that they could find within the story and say, what can we do to focus in on a character to further take this web that Emily St. John Mandel has, has woven and tighten it even more, create more strands between characters um, that are going to be easy for an audience to follow and, and really just draw it all together and then, and then use the visual storytelling that we have at our disposal to uh to shift the mysteries around a little bit like you can just show flashes of things you can show images and that will create a question in the viewer like what is what is the meaning of that um and we talked about how uh, emily st john mandel was so good at doing that in the book in in a narrative way and now that you've put it on screen you're you're not just relying on the way that she was so cleverly able to do it you're bringing in more ways you can do it um, and so I think there's even more mystery sort of wrapped into this as we're we're hoping to figure out how this all connects. Because, again, we are bouncing around from different timelines to different characters. And I guess I can see maybe some people are feeling disoriented by that. Um, but, again, I, I feel like it's motivated. We know who these characters are. We, we introduce them all early. And if you don't 
think that the show is going to lead you somewhere satisfying. I can see growing frustration, but I am so in love with the source material that I'm confident that we're heading somewhere that's going to be satisfying. And I like the surprise of going away from a story that's super interesting and instead we're going to go tell the story of this other character now and we're going to go tell the story of this other character now and draw it together. And again, you're creating these strands that draw it back to the, you know, to the original. Um, so for me, I'm floored by it. I, I feel like this is, I mean, I'm only halfway through the show, so I, can't, I have to reserve a little bit of judgment because, of course, things can fall apart. There could be major changes to come that I won't be as behind. Um, and what they're doing with the changes they've already made has to continue to land. Uh, but that being said, the, the potential is here for this to be my show of the year. Uh, my favorite thing I've seen in a while on TV. Um, I already feel the urge to like shout it from the mountaintops and tell all my friends that they should be watching this thing. Um, I'm loving it. And uh, I, I, yeah, I'm a little sad to hear that maybe you saw some, some criticism out there, but like anything there's gonna be um, for me, I, I am super taken with this. Uh, the performances are incredible. I think, you know, across the board, but in particular Mackenzie Davis uh, moved me to tears. Um, I think she's, she's incredible. And uh, there's particular scenes that I will shout out as we get to them. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm loving this thing. And uh, I have no reservations in saying that. Again, only halfway through, but I'm loving it. I mean, I, I was definitely leading you a little bit to just sort of dash the hopes and like ideas of, of people who like are really disliking the show. But um, I think within the context of the story, you could probably we were already picking up on some of that in the in the book of people sort of bouncing off of it because it is so artists talking about artists. And I think that's some of the reaction that I've seen from people who maybe aren't interested in that as much. But for for us, we've already talked about the source material, but totally enjoying it. It's telling a visual narrative. And I think they're able to pull off a lot of the things that I would have hoped to have seen in an adaptation of this. You know, it's confident. I want to talk about the transition specifically in the way that they like juxtapose the past and the present and the future in a way that's so jarring. And it like, you know, we will cut from something that's like a lively city to something that's not. That is the feeling of the people who all went through it. It's so shocking, so fast. And to like represent that, I think is so cool. So yeah, not going to lie. I kind of set you up to just sort of like ch jump on the happy train for this. <laughs> you made me, you made me jump in at, at critics that I don't even know who they are and what they said, but I'm already like ready to fight. <laughs> There's not a lot. Like I said, there was just I was just surprised that it wasn't unanimous. But, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, with any story you have, there's a little bit of it's not for everyone. But I'm absolutely loving the story. It was giving me vibes that I'm sure you might have picked up on as well. And it wasn't until I went to do research that I was like vindicated because I was like, this show feels a lot like leftovers to me mm. in, in certain ways. I can see that. I think it has to do with like the the dark comedic elements mixed in with like things you could never predict coming like thinking of like the end of episode four things like that like changes that they've made that are just like holy fucking shit it's more surreal at times too that there's moments of surrealism or or, or like reality bending stuff that appears to happen that reminds me of leftovers uh come to find out patrick somerville wrote on i believe all of the leftovers so okay. he was a writer that totally makes sense <laughs> what a what a great person to get on board for this project then because i think i think that style matches this so perfectly and uh leftovers is an example of mysteries done right in my opinion i mean again that's a story that's a uh, a show that has its detractors and it was kind of uh it kind of flew under the radar even at its height i, I it was never mainstream massive show it always had like a devoted fan base and i think that's probably going to be the same case for this like i haven't heard a ton of buzz even in the circles I go in, which tends to be people who are like really into stuff like this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I do want to start getting more people to watch it, because I think the show deserves more buzz, much like The Leftovers. I, I try and tell everybody they should watch it. And I I'm I feel the same way about this. I, I think the only misgiving I would have there is that it's quite sad at times and it is dealing with a pandemic. So you touch in a little bit on that sort of like exhaustion people have about hearing about pandemics. And that's unfortunate because the show is so good and it was written and started to be, I, I, I was, I'm really curious about the timeline and production, but mm -hmm. this, oh, yeah, I've th got that. this thing was being made before the pandemic. Right. And then, and then that happened. It had to change everything, man. 
I'll tell you here soon. But let me finish up like sort of why I love the show also. So we're talking about, of course, there's the pandemic element that some people are not going to be ready to watch yet. And that's fine. But I love how the story in the same way that the novel did in, in the show is able to check in on things that make up the society in the same kind of way. Like, what did we lose? What was society? What would it mean to recreate a society? And uh, in that way, specifically performance and the way that like in a visual medium like this, we can watch people give the speech from Independence Day. We can watch, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. these amazing moments that that are so funny or so good, like blow your mind, Shakespearean performances and stuff in there as well. And and like in in its own sort of vein of a Shakespearean story, because like there's obviously elements that they're dealing with within this world. So, you know, all of that to say, like musicians, actors, anyone involved in writing or filmmaking, the arts in that way, I think you're going to respond well to this story because it is in inherently sort of about how that is what makes the world go around in a way, or at least keeps the world going around and, and keeps people like uh, able to live in their everyday lives and express themselves and stuff like that. And I know, of course, like I said, it might not be for everybody, but for, for me, I, I think it's a really powerful story. And and it goes to show like the humanity in art and how like you can't pull it away. Pull it. Every piece of art has humanity. It's inextricably linked. Like you can't pull it apart. It's it is art. And the the way that the show has been able to represent that from the source material has just been amazing adaptation so far. Yeah, you know, and you're 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 talking about people maybe resisting the focus on art, and we kind of addressed this in our last episode, right? About how. This material is really about the intersection of art and culture and how each one feeds into the other, about how our, uh, you know, our, the creations in our entertainment feed our culture and our culture in turn creates more art and feeds the other way around. It's this loop. And all of a sudden you take a hatchet to the loop and you chop it in half and now you have to figure out how to begin to rebuild it. Um, Yet you see the role it plays in in a sort of functioning society, and how it is important. Um, and if if you disagree with that, then like I don't know, it, it's weird because it's like, don't you watch TV? Don't you watch movies? Well, there are people who don't. But 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 are they watching this show? Right. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> like if you're watching this show, like you should agree with this. And it's yeah. weird to me if people were were would to were to disagree with that statement. I don't yeah. know. Anyway. <laughs> but it also, like we, we, we said in our last episode, it also might be people being exhausted by actors sort of like patting other actors on the, like performance and yeah, art. Yeah, I, I, but I think that's surface level. I think there's a lot more to it than that. It probably helps that we've read the book, whereas a lot of people have maybe only seen the show and are, are more focused on that, that actor performance thing. And I think that might be like some of what it is, is like not necessarily trusting the show to take you, like you said, to a satisfying conclusion and maybe like getting bogged down in the beginning because you weren't that interested in like the troop or something like that. But I, I think it's worth sticking around for. Yeah, I've never been someone who is like particularly sensitive to the perception of per pretension in art. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I tend to be more accepting of that. Pretension is from a it comes from a weird place like where is that coming from in people because you can you can say like oh it's not for me but to sort of be like vehemently against it has always been weird to me because it's we all know that it's not necessarily everything isn't for everyone right I, again i feel like a little bit like i'm uh, tilting at windmills thing like i i don't know that i'm i don't even know who i'm reacting to <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm going to have to like do do some do some research myself and see what people are saying. But for now, I'm just going to try and live in my bubble of happy because I, I am really enjoying the show a lot. You were talking about sort of the loop that society creates. And I think that this show is doing an interesting job of when that loop has been severed and we have a generation of people who are born post and an, like basically apocalypse like this. Um what that's going to do to their psyche and themselves and their rebellion and their life and the way that they're not reacting to things from before because they didn't know anything before. And then it's very interesting because it's in conversation, to me at least, with children who have gone through the pandemic that we are living through. Absolutely. And how that psychologically is going to be affecting them. And, and to have that conversation 
like pre, during, and post pandemic, which I'm about to tell you about, uh, is really interesting. So the production of this started in Chicago in January of 2020. Wow. And was about one fifth completed before having to shut down in March of 2020 because of COVID-19. Filming resumed in February 2021 in Canada and wrapped that July. So the series about life before, during, and after a catastrophic worldwide pandemic was filmed before and during and aired during a catastrophic worldwide pandemic. Unbelievable that that happened. That's, yep. that's I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about years to come, that, that that actually occurred. Right. I mean, think about how harrowing it is for the people who are working on this, where it's a 99% kill rate. Yeah. And the people who are working on it have to walk away and go quarantine because something bad is is affecting the world. And like they, they're actively engrossed in what could potentially happen and just how horrifying that could be unbelievable yeah uh <laughs> yeah i don't even know how how you how you wrap your head around that uh, as creators but 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 i see i see the uh effects of it right like there are moments where i'm like this was written post covid you know what right. i mean like there are a few mm-hmm. things here or there that are directly speaking about our experience right now during covid and uh it, it's it's amazing because if this show had completed filming right before COVID, you you know, it could, it could almost suffer from it. Right. It could almost come, it could almost come in and be like, nah, this, this clearly, they didn't know what they were talking about when they did it. Um, exactly. It might feel hollow. Like they, they, it was like disingenuous or something. Yeah. Even though they couldn't have had the foresight to know that it was going to happen. Yeah. Wow. It would happen. So, I want to talk about Patrick Somerville okay. and specifically about his adaptation process because this is going to give us a whole can of worms to open up. So Patrick Somerville is an American novelist and television writer. So he is a writer who has been published. He has two novels and two short story collections that have come out. But just thinking about this person who was a, is a writer and also is adapting someone else's work to come from it in a writing perspective, like, you you know, you're going to have feelings about how something should be adapted and like i think that's an advantage for sure um but it also must be really weird because at some point you have to like getting rid of the things that don't work for the show or changing them in some way or adding and like you mentioned the way that they're adding things to the story doesn't feel like they're adding or subtracting it feels like they're like layering expanding is what i I felt like right it's like the take a character who's been well established give maybe a little more backstory show us some scenes that were mentioned um, and expand in that way. And I found that to be really effective. And for the most part, although there is at least one significant change we could talk about here in episode one when we get to it. And there hasn't been any moments where I'm like, this doesn't feel necessary to the story, which is always important in an adaptation like this. So uh, to continue with Patrick Somerville, he published his debut novel, The Cradle, in 2009, and his second novel, The Bright River, in 2012. In 2013, he joined the writing staff of The Bridge, where he wrote two episodes of the series. From 2015 to 2017, he was a writer on the HBO series The Leftovers. In October of 2016, it was announced that Somerville would write the Netflix series Maniac. In December 2017, he signed a deal to develop new TV and digital projects exclusively for Paramount TV. And then in October 2019, it was announced that he would write and show run a 10 episode HBO Max series Station Eleven. Um, I, I am in, you know, I'm impressed. I I see someone who has come in and identified areas that you can look at and say, this isn't a weakness in the story, but it is a place that is maybe underdeveloped um, if you were going to, if you were to stretch things out, like there are certain areas in the story that start to get thin. And you can look at those areas and say, what can I add to to bring that up and to make it more uh, direct? Because a lot of the stuff is sort of hinted at or it's subtext- subtextual. And instead, you want to, like, make it the plot of an episode. Um, and so, you know, there's some stuff that gets changed there. And you were talking about the the role that the children play in this story. And I think that's, a, that's an example of him identifying something that was present in the book. Yet, it wasn't uh, this... It was almost something that, like, someone could read the book and, and, and take it away and take take that read of it. Um, and it would be something you could talk about in your reading group and say, actually, you know what? I, I thought this was, was, was hinting at. And yet he took that and said like, no, that's going to be the, the core belief 
of this group and stuff like that. Like, or that's going to be a core uh, or a central conflict with our within the characters is this dividing line between pre and post pandemic life. It was present in the novel, but it's it's like that is that is front and center in this show. Some of the changes that he makes to characters are almost always in order to amplify like the emotional connections between characters. Like it's almost like he's found a way to to take some of the characters and sort of weave them even tighter than the than the novel was because I think and and this is not a spoiler, but it's going to be leaning towards some ideas that you could think about as you watch the show if you haven't. And that's just that like the book is meant to be sort of more of a mystery for longer, I think. And as far as we've gotten through five episodes, some of those reveals have come in a lot sooner in the story than I would have expected. And maybe that's, you know, of course, that's probably intentional. But the idea of doing that makes obviously the some of the mysteries less important within the story because you're getting them so much further and farther away from the climax of the story. So, you know, that's interesting to think about when in when you're thinking about it in terms of like the ways that certain characters stick around in the story maybe or that they didn't in the book and um i think it it lends itself to a lot of emotional stakes so it's it's worked really well for me um within this bio for patrick somerville i mentioned uh, net on netflix the show maniac did you ever watch that no okay that's another one that like after i read because that one i didn't pick up on any vibes of but after i read that he that he wrote maniac totally along the same sort of like tone and like the way the the visual style maybe is is different but you can still feel the sort of same vision behind it so i I definitely feel like these the 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 leftovers maniac and now station 11 have a lot of similar dna not necessarily in story in any way but you know what i mean like in terms of vision Mm -hmm. yeah i can see that i'm curious to look into it one other person that i want to talk about that's important to the production of this show is Hiro Murai. And Hiro Murai is a Japanese-born American filmmaker based in Los Angeles. And he's he's awesome. I he's been a rock star since he like showed up on the scene. So his notable works uh include internationally successful music videos for artists such as Childish Gambino, Earl Sweatshirt, David Greta, St. Vincent, The Shins, The Fray, Block Party, and Queens of the Stone Age, to name a few. Um so that's sort of where he got his start, but then when I became aware of him was in 2016, he directed several episodes of the comedy drama Atlanta, collaborating again with Donald Glover, a.k.a. Childish Gambino. So he's like a longtime collaborator with Donald Glover. Did he direct uh, This Is America, that music video? He did. He did? He did, yeah. Wow. I was getting to that, yeah. What a classic. That's great. That video has been described as the most talked about music video of recent memory. Yeah, by Twitter, I would say. <laughs> like that was And huge. I think it ranked 10th among the greatest music videos of the 21st century. In 2019, he won a Grammy Award for Best Music Video for directing the video. I mean, I remember when that dropped, it was like a watershed moment. Mm-hmm. Like it was just like oh, yeah. so, so powerful as well. You know, mm-hmm. it's like a, it's a super catchy song that I think a lot of people might miss the messaging on sometimes, but it's it's incredible. And and the video. Yeah, you can't miss it if you watch the video. <laughs> exactly. And I think the video was was just as powerful. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, he actually directed the first episode, which we've talked many wow. times about okay. with series how important it is for a director to come on for the first episode and sort of set the tone for what's going to be going forward, the visual style, um, just overall, like it's a very important role. And he he would then direct episode three later on, Uh which we'll talk about. But I, I just thought it was really important to mention him as well. And what a, what an awesome like collaborator to have on the first episode. So is Somerville technically the showrunner then? Who's the showrunner? Is Somerville? Okay, cool. Somerville. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to them both. Yep, definitely killing it. So, and everybody who works on the show, honestly, it's just a really well made thing. So, I don't know how HBO can continue this level of quality. I know, for right? the past like 30, 40 years or whatever it's been. Like, brief aside, it makes me very excited for the Last of Us uh, adaptation. But me too. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> it's going to be a very different kind of post apocalyptic show, but I'm still super excited. Okay, so episode one is called Wheel of Fire. After famous actor Arthur Leander dies on stage, audience member Jeevan Chaudhry accompanies abandoned child actor Kirsten Raymond home. On their way, Jeevan gets an early warning that a deadly virus has descended on the world. When Kirsten's parents aren't home, Jeevan and Kirsten buy several grocery carts worth of food and barricade themselves inside a Chicago apartment with Jeevan's brother, Frank. From his windows, they watch a plane fall from the sky and crash in a fiery explosion, their first sign that something major is wrong. In a flash forward, we see Jeevan and Kirsten leaving the apartment alone several months later in a snowy wasteland filled with abandoned cars. 
Finally, we see adult Kirsten rehearsing a play while reading a graphic novel called Station Eleven that had once belonged to Arthur Leander. Uh, we open with the, uh, the the theater. It's like an abandoned theater. We see it's kind of grown over and desolate, and we're slowly coming into it. Yet it's still sort of, um, it's got that almost like a chapel feel, like a cathedral. Mm-hmm. There's like a glow to the lighting. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom, it transitions and everybody's in there and we're back in, you know, current times and you hear a cough, I think, significantly. <laughs> um, and then the performance, right? And, and this is the opening scene of the novel as well. We meet Jeevan, who runs up on stage after he notices something's astray and uh, goes to help and I think notably is unable to really help. Like He noticed something was wrong quickly and got up there and kind of called for a doctor. But like, I think they asked him, like, do you know CPR? And he didn't say anything. And I guess the implication was he didn't. And then they got the defibrillator out to, to do it. Now, I have a couple of thoughts about that. One is one is uh, storytelling and one is practical. Practical, um, just start doing chest compressions. Like that is yep. by far the most important thing you can be doing. <laughs> and I was like in my head yelling at them. Somebody start doing chest compressions immediately. Um, and no one was doing it. They go and get the defibrillator, which unclear whether or not that would even help in this moment. Cause unlike TV wants to tell you defibrillators don't start your heart back up from not pumping. You're, it, well, they notably like when you put the patches on, it tells you if, if it's charge ready, like it'll tell you if you can give it a charge or not. Right. But, but the, the point is if your heart is stopped, you don't want to shock that person that doesn't restart right. their heart. That's not how it works. It's more for correcting uh, arrhythmias, as far as my understanding of it is. Um, what you want to be doing is chest compressions, way more important. Anyway, um, that's beside the point. <laughs> um, what I thought was notable from a storytelling perspective is that Jeevan wants to help and is unable to. And so there's sort of an impotence of his ability to make a difference here. Um, but very importantly, he meets uh, Kirsten, child Kirsten for the first time. And then connects with her after the fact, talking to her. She has this uh, extremely funny deadpan delivery of a bunch of lines. A um, couple times whenever she says, I'm eight, it's hilarious. Uh, and I wanted to shout her out. And that's Matilda Lawler, it looks like. Killing it. For, as, as a child actor to do this well, I, I'm amazed. We've talked many times about child actors, too. It can be hit or miss. Yeah. And, and like they nailed a lot of these. There's more than just her in this show that, that are child actors, and, and they kill it. And specifically, the chemistry between Jeevan and Kirsten yeah. and the, their actors is is incredible. Yeah. It's, it's very, it's really, like I said, there's that dark humor all around this giant global pandemic. And yet, like, there's moments of levity. There's moments of life and humanity and, like, um, they they nailed the casting. Yeah, and it said those we I've heard it described as those little moments are like um, you know how when you use a pressure cooker, um, especially like an instant pot type deal, as it's pressurizing, there will still be a little valve that lets off little hisses every now and then, and they tell you in the like guide that that's normal, that that's part of the process. And to me, that's how it is when you're doing something that's so dramatic and so pressurized is you have to have little moments to let off steam. You have just a little bit here or there, little hisses of steam get released. And those little moments of levity help do that to where it's not oppressive. Um, And I think that works really, really well here. Yeah, it's tough. Comedic relief is something difficult to balance too, right? Because you can totally ruin the tone of the show. for sure. If not handled correctly. And it's like they they are doing it expertly here. Yeah, you can't have a show that it's as serious and heavy as this this is if you have slapstick, like broad humor here or there coming up again or you can't have the marvel like irony like uh one-liners and 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 just like banter like you can't have that all the time and still attain the sh- the tone that you need and want for a show like this yeah so you have to walk that fine line and i think they're doing that really well and that's just up to the writing like yeah. great writing great writing uh and performances and 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 direction and, and vision for what you want and so we got to talk about the big change, right? So the biggest change, I think, so far is that Jeevan and Kirsten go together to his brother's apartment and s- survive the apocalypse together. That does not happen in the book. So for people who have not read the book are going to be shocked to hear, I think, that's not a book thing. And, and it's an incredible change. And I love it. I love this change. I love that it ties those two characters together together in a really intimate way instead of a a couple thing removed way like they meet each other in the book 
but they mm-hmm. don't survive the apocalypse together. Well, Jeevan effectively takes the place of her brother over that year that she that she doesn't remember. Yeah. Oh, and, and clearly, and then, as you just mentioned, in the book, she doesn't remember a lot of, like, that transitory period. And, in fact, we don't get a lot of it because she doesn't remember it. And here it's like, well, that's a blank spot in the narrative. I don't know that viewers are going to be happy with just, oh, I don't remember it. Who knows what happened? So they decided to make it work for them. And this change makes it work. If you told me that, like, some older man was able to get like a eight year old girl to, to go live with him at, like with a pandemic, you know, they have to, they set it up in a way that was believable and, you know, heartwarming when it's like, it's creepy inherently for like an older man to like convince a girl to come stay with him and say, there's an apocalypse and your parents aren't coming for you or whatever, whatever this yeah. said. That moment where he decides to lie to her is really, really interesting one because he, he has this, you can tell he's weighing it. Right. And he's like, it's like the the pull, push and pull of her wanting to give her autonomy and let her do the things she wants to do. But as she said multiple times to him, I'm eight. And he realizes in this moment that she's his responsibility now. And he can't just let her walk away. And if he does, he will forever regret it. And the fake phone call was funny and like heartwarming yeah. in a way. And, and it kind of felt like she knew it was fake, but I, I don't know. It, it was unclear. He, he, and he was ki- killing him. He doesn't want to lie and do this. But like he's like, I got to convince an eight year old girl to come to stay with me, which yeah. is the weirdest thing But it was thing funny because it was almost like, I just got to give her a reason. She wants to go with me, but she knows enough. She's been taught enough to, that she can't say yes without some sort of reason. So I have to give it to her. And then their whole journey, they're going through the, I love the supermarket shots where it's its zoomed way out and you can just see all this food. Like it's just everywhere and it's so much. and it's Perfectly stocked. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and it's just so plentiful. And you, and of course we know what's coming. So you're amazed. And then when he was walking down the aisle with his little basket, grabbing a couple of yoo-hoos, I'm like, what are you doing? This is not enough. And then he comes to his senses, thankfully, and goes and gets starts getting the carts. My my <laughs> girlfriend pointed out, like, uh, she thought for sure in that moment that there was going to be a cart full of toilet paper that he's rolling <laughs> with as well. I mean, I bet there was some in one of them carts. Um, so funny, yeah. And 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 uh, hit the call. I love the change that they did where instead of it being just like some random friend he had who's a doctor, it's his sister. Yes. See, that, that's what I meant about like re sort of evaluating some of the characters yeah. for emotional weight. Yeah, exactly. Because that makes it more emotionally impactful. And she says something to him. It was like uh, she talks about their childhood together in a memory. And then she says, like, I liked when we were children. And it, that's the thing that sells it to him that how serious this is. And I love he's he's in sh- complete shock. He just like wanders off the train. And it and it that's actually the moment of choice. For Kirsten, talking about wanting her to make her own decisions, she could have stayed on the train. She knew where to get off. But instead, she was like, I'm going to get off with Jeevan now because I'm worried about him. And I want to see what this phone call was about. Right. As they're bringing the carts in, when they get to the elevator, that scene was so real where that woman was trying to get in with her lamp or whatever. And he's like, he's like, no, fuck off. Like <laughs> I, that was like, I don't, I'm sure that you had the same situation. Like when the pandemic hit trying to avoid like we have to go to our local supermarket we have to get in we're in a parking garage and then take an elevator up and down with our carts and like people would try to get on like you know during the pandemic yeah. the height of the pandemic and i was it was always a situation where i was like we would just have like two carts and take up the entire elevator and it's like as much of a dick move as that is it was the thing to do at the time it was so real yeah. that they had that they had that scene in there and it was funny and like Showed the seriousness of the situation. Uh, I live in a condo that has an elevator to get up and down. So, yes, I had that experience multiple times where people uh, it, it, we, there was rules that sent out to our entire community and posted that there was a one, you know, like one group limit, basically like you or you and your partner or whatever. Like that's the limit. And then you have to you're supposed to wait. And then people, of course, didn't want to do that. And they'd always ask to come on. And if you said no, like they, you know, they give you a look like you're the biggest dick in the world. And you're like. You know, this was before, you know, vaccines and stuff. This was during that, like, more heightened time. But, um, yeah, it's it, it's it's definitely something we've lived through. And uh, it, it, all of that just informs this show in a, you know, fascinating way. So one, another thing that I loved, uh, they, they finally get to the uh, apartment. And um, his brother is like, what the fuck are you talking about? Frank is like, you know, he doesn't believe him at all. And then uh, Kirsten walks over. Oh, I love the, and he, he just calls her like little white girl, which was really funny. Um, she walks over to the window and sees this plane come down and crash. And that's not something that we see happen in the book. 
Um, but I thought, again, you're, you're using the strength of the medium. You're like, we're in this big apartment with these windows. What can we do? And you show the, the plane crash. And I think that also sets up stuff with air travel later that uh, works just really, really well. Um, and, uh, and it's a good visual way to sell something's really bad here. You know, we saw the guy in his car, but, uh, this is, this is really bad. And, uh, I know another little moment that I absolutely loved was the doctors at the hospital, right? Like they're, I was getting like, you know, the, the, the band or the, or the crew going down with the ship kind of vibes from them. They're like, they all know they're fucked. And they're like, we're just going to do what we can. And the three doc, I think they were doctors are all going to leave. And it seems like they're just like, we got to go be with our families or whatever. And they get stopped by somebody who's got someone who's in, you know, in trouble and needs help. And one of the doctors like, all right, I'll show you where to go. And it's like, clearly that guy's just decided I'm just going to keep being a doctor until I die because I'm going to die soon. And this is what I do. And I'm going to go do that. And that was powerful to me, but you know, especially with everything we've seen with frontline workers through COVID and just how heroic and brave and like, I don't know. It's 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 tough because you don't want to like. It's it's always weird to say like how heroic and stuff frontline workers are when our society isn't giving them the support of heroes in the same way that we do like our troops and stuff, right? Like it's frustrating. And well, it's frustrating because early on, before a vaccine, it felt like they were being treated right. as they should. But then they became synonymous with the disease itself to some people, and it's very frustrating. So I don't know. I I, I like that moment because. I do I do think it's it's heroic and and not in a way that that um takes away the reality that it is also a job for them and it's something that they have to go do day in and day out and is dangerous and exhausting. Um I think it can be both of those things. It can be a job, it can be the way that they make money, but it can also be something heroic and something that is an emotional drain that uh and something that they have to do despite public, you know, opinion sometimes shifting. And people fucking protesting at hospitals and stuff. Uh, I, I thought that was just a small, small moment that I loved. While we're talking about it, a special shout out to my mom who worked in the ER through all of this and has been for like 20, 25 years. Absolutely. And like, I just want to shout her out because I think about her every time. Any any nurse, anything in any show, I'm always thinking about my mom. So shout out to her for making it through all of this so far. And hopefully, it, you know, we hit an endemic at some point here soon. <laughs> so, so episode two is called A Hawk from a Handsaw. 20 years after the outbreak of the virus, Kirsten is a member of the Traveling Symphony, a nomadic group of actors and musicians who perform Shakespearean plays. In the past, teenage Kirsten meets Sarah, aka the Conductor, who invites her to join the Traveling Symphony. On their travels, Kirsten meets a suspicious man, David, who lies about his origins and when confronted, threatens her friends and quotes the rare Station Eleven graphic novel which Arthur gave her. When questioned, he only references a prophecy. 20 years earlier, at the outset of the virus, Kirsten learns her parents are deceased via text message. In the the present, 2040, a man from the Museum of Civilization approaches Sarah to perform at their community. Yeah, wow. Um, This episode was great. And uh, you're, you're just reminding me of little moments of like these text messages. And how clever they are showing the little uh, misspellings or, or uh, autocorrect problems. It's like these little annoyances that we all deal with on the mo- you know in our modern lives, and yet they they just hit different when you know that these are some of the last text messages these people are ever going to be able to send because that's all going away. Uh, I don't know. It's really that's really fascinating. Um, and then again, like talking about stuff that we we didn't get to see, like we get to see young Kirsten approach Sarah, who is the conductor and, and that first interaction where she ends up joining the troop. Like we don't get that in the book. Um, I, I don't remember getting it at least in this way. So, so that's the kind of stuff where you can find little moments that book readers are going to eat up and want to see, and you get to introduce them. Um, and we get the implication here too, of a mystery that has yet to be answered. And it's one that exists solely within the show. And uh, it, that, that's what happened to Jeevan. Why is she alone when she, when she meets up with the conductor? And we don't know because, again, they weren't together in the book. So and like we kind of know the fate of Jeevan in the book, but like it could be completely different now because they've done this change. Um, and I kind of expect it is. I mean, through five episodes, I think it's still clear we don't know exactly what. No, happened. we don't. Yeah, I mean, we maybe have some guesses that we could we could put forth, but yeah, we don't know. But again, this is like another place where it's like we there's even more opportunities to show things that we didn't fully get. But then we get introduced to the to the traveling troupe, which is 
so well done. I, I am this is like my favorite part of the show is the maybe the costuming. I, I don't know. Like the costuming oh, of this amazing. is absolutely incredible. The visual storytelling, the idea that you can tell the story of these people and how they're able to put on these shows and what they're able to turn into costumes. Now I'm saying like they're wearing costumes in, in the production within the narrative of the story, but also the people behind the scenes who are making these costumes. It's incredible because every little choice you're making is telling a story about how you're able to do it. And like taking the sleeves of a bunch of jackets and putting them and making them into like a big cloak or that are the or a bunch of gloves and putting them together on a dress and like all these it's just so cool and and, and you're showing the ingenuity um and then the the way they're able to craft these productions the colors the the lights like everything about it is so incredible i was really taken with it and then i think it's a brilliant choice to have a new character introduced to the troupe who has not been a part of it has to try out. You were referring to earlier the Independence Day speech, which definitely had me laughing. So funny that, that he gives that, and um, and it fits within the story too. It's it does. Like, there's like, there's some overlap there that it, it, it yeah the survival and yeah we will go on and all this stuff yeah, um, but they you get this new guy in the troop and through him you can introduce the way it works because he's a newbie right and so we're newbies we don't know how it works and and, it, and through telling him you're cleverly telling us information about how this all works. So that's so well done. And then I was kind of surprised how quickly how quickly uh, the prophet is introduced. And we don't know he's the prophet here, but over the, throughout the course of time, we do find out um, that he... But we know he's nefarious from the, from the jump. And we don't know who the prophet is yet, so I'll, we can withhold that until we get there. But um, yeah, the introduction of this guy who's immediately kind of creepy, and I love that Kirsten picks up on how creepy he is. And they do a lot of smart stuff to make it feel vulnerable. Like I think it's specifically chosen to have him approach Alex and Kirsten while they're swimming um, and, and unarmed basically, you know, they're, they're, they've disrobed somewhat, right? They're not naked, but they're, they're down to like bathing suits. And like, I think there's an inherent sense of vulnerability when you're in that. And, and so when they're standing in front of him and he's being kind of creepy and like looking at them, you feel like just off put by it all. In his whole behavior, and um, I, again, you're just doing that f- through visual storytelling, and I think it just works so well. Um, and then you just have him creeping in the background, and then, uh, uh, gosh, I just love that she stabs him just right off the bat when he's <laughs> <she's, laughs> so good. He's like, well, I'm going to start before... saying something kind of threatening. Oh, I'm already being stabbed. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And like, you know, I, I'm getting to watch the show through my girlfriend who didn't read the book. Oh man. I've been wanting to get my wife to watch it, but she's been holding off because it's, because it is sad. And you know what I mean? Like, it's like, you have to kind of be in the mood for a, a sad show. So I'm hoping at some points I'm going to convince her to actually watch it. Cause I, I want to relive it through her. I'm, I'd watch it again. Like I can already tell us the show I'd watch again. So the, just when he's getting, stabbed like she's like no way he's not dead yet he's not that kind of thing <laughs> yeah and i'm like in my head i'm like holy shit he got fucking stabbed <laughs> well i wasn't sure if it was actually the prophet yet or not at that point or just like a, somebody who's in his group um but sure enough um and then but then when he quoted it was like okay maybe he quotes station 11 and that was kind of a giveaway uh- I got to talk about my favorite scene from this episode, which is brutally sad and also just like an amazing performance. And that's when Kirsten is playing Hamlet and it's sort of juxtaposed with the cutting, like the cross cutting to her melting down after receiving the text that her parents' bodies are being stored at a morgue and not to go there. The weight of the story to take a Shakespearean tragedy. Hamlet, who lost his parent, who lost his father, I think is at this point in the in the play. And then and then you have that with with her it's just so it's so smart and it's so powerful and i was just my eyes were glued to the screen the fire the way that she's lit by fire in the performance and it's so blue and well, the... her eyes got this color like color to them and stuff like and then the, and again the costuming it's all working and so you well. talked about mackenzie davis's performance like uh, unbelievable like right there that scene i was like oh my god give her every award i think so right I, okay i'm not alone i'm like uh, that it's funny i love that you highlighted that it was going to be my next scene i was going to talk about that is it the first point in the series that got genuine tears for me. Um, and that was on the power of the performance coming together with everything you're talking about, because this is doing something that I should have talked about last week and that I was going to, I was hopeful they would be able to do in the book. Their performance of Shakespeare is mentioned 
it's alluded to. We maybe get a few lines here or there, but we don't get a lot of scenes that are reproducing the words of Shakespeare because that wouldn't really be that interesting to read. But if you take an incredible Shakespearean performance and you put it on screen and you're, you're performing a scene that is thematically tied to everything else that's happening within your narrative, and then you're intercutting with flashbacks, um, you can create something absolutely stunning. And they do so here, and then it all goes through Mackenzie Davis, who I've been a fan of for a long time, big fan of in, in Halt, and Ca- Halt and Catch Fire. I really liked her in that show, and she was in Blade Runner 2049. I'm sure I've seen her in other things, but... She was in that amazing episode of Black Mirror with the San Junipero, I think it's called. I don't think I've seen that one. I haven't seen oh, a, a, all of Black Mirror. so I'm, I've One of the best them. episodes of, of Black Mirror. I bet. I, I mean, I'm just a big fan of hers. And she has these really expressive eyes that I think must be such a huge asset for any actor. If you have just very big eyes that, that just convey a ton of emotion. Um, and, and if you know how to use them in your performance, right, it's cause it's subtle, but it's powerful when you can just convey so much through the eyes. And, uh, that, that's to me the sign of a really spectacular performance. And she was given it here. I felt all the weight of that PTSD. And that's such a theme of the show, right? Like the, all the people who live through the fall of society are just damaged. And I remember damage quote from the station 11 keeps coming up over and over again, the comic. And uh, it, it, it that's in the book, but you've taken it and made it like so core to the story here. And the difference between the people who live through the fall and the people who were born after um, is quite dramatic. And uh, you can you can see how young people would start to view all those who have lived through it as like broken individuals who are making bad decisions. I love we're going to get to it eventually, but there's that that scene between Alex and Kirsten and there she's talking about how like she can't handle the structure. And it's like people who knew the past, like sort of crave the mundaneness, they they crave the everydayness of structure. And these people coming up that don't know the past, they just want to live and have fun and rebel and they don't know what they've lost in, in that way. So I love that, like the way that this show is coming together with those themes yeah let's let's talk about that when we get there the way that station 11 has been set up for us so far and how we're actually getting some scenes of this like space Space man Man. and the way that he's like in some of the scenes with characters and then we'll just literally be on the station at times i think that's so cool to have taken the time to do that rather than it just being a comic book that the characters are living in like let us enter the comic book and live in it for a little that's awesome it's so cool and it creates a complete what the fuck moment for the viewer that felt like Watchmen a little bit to me, although Watchmen dabbles in that like way more. But like, it's just so surreal, and you're like, is this even real right now, or is this a dream, or is this just like farcical? Like, what what am I actually seeing right now? And um, if you haven't read the book, then you're you're totally in the dark about it. So, um, yeah, I think that's really fascinating, and I, and I love that they're doing it. It's a little playful, but I, I love that they're doing it. And we were talking about Shakespeare before. Something else is the way that. It's sort of played with, right? Like they're they're talking about like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna deconstruct Shakespeare and we're gonna do this and oh, it's so why are we performing Shakespeare? The way that the the show is interacting with Shakespeare and art is really fascinating to me because some people like it, some people don't, and that's just like everyday life. Like I felt like in the book, it was mo- very much more like everybody was on board, everybody loved performing Shakespeare because they understood the importance. But it's interesting to me that like the people who know how important it is and the people who know what it means and what it means to storytelling want to continue this this like oral tradition and and continue these performances. And then other people are like, let's do new things, write something new, do this and that. And and I just thought that was a nice wrinkle to add to to the traveling troupe. I thought it it, it makes it it makes for interest. And then, of course, we get the line where it's like we're going to deconstruct Hamlet and do it with like. 90s rock or something like that and like i i just thought that was funny and also like i would check that yeah. out like um it, it does stand out to me even more here that it would feel weird to do a modern play in this setting because that would be referencing what we just lost it's almost like the wounds too fresh so you would just make everybody sad whereas if you do shakespeare's and you have it set in like the you know 700 years ago like we're not sad about that time. Nobody was alive who was around for that time. That time is clearly long, long past, and it's distant from our lives. So there's sort of a universal uh, quality 
to doing a Shakespearean performance in, in this post-apocalyptic world. So I can see why that, I, I, I believe that that would be a thing that, that they could go, they could latch on to that would work. Uh, and so not only are they referencing it in larger ways, there's also like smaller things. Like at one point, the character August, they're, they're talking about like, what was, what was the prophet character's wife's name? Cause he's lying and saying he has a wife and he's lost all this stuff. And, and th- then one of the characters is like Rose. And then August, the character is like, by any other name, yeah. like as a reference to that quote. And so it's like a, to the way that they're playing with it, mm-hmm. it's like so baked into this story in small ways and in large ways. Like the different the different plays that they're referencing to like when we performed this one in this city, I, I, I just find it to be really interesting, like how deep and Shakespearean the story I really is. Yeah, I, I mean, and to to uh, underscore what you're talking about, when we first meet Kirsten, she's uh, as an as like adult Kirsten, basically. They're talking about Hamlet and she doesn't want to play Hamlet. But then, you know, she's mm-hmm. like it, it clearly it emotionally gets to her too much. And then Sarah's like, but that's why you're so good at it. Right. Like it's like that's why you have to do it. And uh, the way that she is clearly embodying the weight and the sadness of Hamlet, who's this like mopey kid, basically mopey young adult Hamlet. Um, uh, it, it totally makes sense. And, and I think you're right. I think you're right on They're They're doing all this deliberately. Okay, so episode three is called Hurricane. In the past, Arthur meets and spends time with love interest Miranda, who is the author of the Station Eleven graphic novel Kirsten continually references. In 2007, they are married and living together, but clash over Miranda's work for Leon, her boss, and her hours devoted to completing her graphic novel. Arthur takes an interest in a woman named Elizabeth and shows her the graphic novel, prompting Miranda to leave him after setting the pool house and her graphic novel on fire. In 2020, Miranda visits Arthur to deliver a published copy of the graphic novel and gives him two copies, an additional one for his son, Tyler. Later, Miranda attempts to flee a work trip in Malaysia as the virus spreads, but is told by mutual friend Clark Thompson that Arthur died on stage that night. Miranda chooses to stay in Malaysia, taping up her hotel room door in an attempt to keep the virus out as she sees images from her graphic novel. Wow, what a, what a cool episode. Again, this is a... a- pretty big departure from what happens in the book in in a lot of ways. Um, We get more with Miranda and it's definitely similar to what happens in the book. Um, It's just expanded to me. Like there's, there's definitely changes, but it's kind of just the, what the small snapshot that we got turned into a whole episode. Like you referenced earlier. And I thought it was notable that it's the year 2020 in the show. They decided to keep that knowing full well, COVID happens in 2020 and will forever be remembered as the year of COVID. You know what I mean? Like right. we're going to look back at this thing 30, 40 years from now and people are going to say, oh, yeah, 2020, the year of COVID. Like that's that's going to be the number one thing people remember about that year, I think. And you make this show and you say that the super flu comes in and kills everybody in that year. And clearly it takes the place of COVID because this isn't a world where COVID has happened. So I think there was a deliberate choice to say we're going to tell an alternate reality story where COVID. COVID essentially came in this form and killed everybody. Um, Mm -hmm. That's an interesting choice to make. Uh, You know, it's a bold choice to make. And I think it pays dividends because it makes it feel timely and it makes it feel like they're really trying to make a statement about our, our current lives and, you know, our reaction to the pandemic and what if it had been worse sort of idea. Um, So I just wanted to get that out there. I think that's something that they are deliberately doing. I agree. Yeah, I was I was kind of surprised to see it because, you know, I can definitely see people who lost loved ones in 2020 not reacting super well to the fact that they're sort of playing with that story. But at the same time, like it it kind of is the logical thing to do with this story. But this story is all about loss and all about coming to like in in, and collective grief. Right. Well, you made a story about collective grief in 2020. Like, that's amazing. That that was actually happening. It's not just ostensibly about or, or even like some similarities in, in, um, in, in subject matter. Like you got with the stand, like th- this story is all about collective grief and society. And, um, it's so, it's so incredible that it came out at this time, but yeah, I have to say, I was really happy to see Miranda get her own, her own chapter, her own section of the story. And she's interesting as a character on her own. I love her, her like stubbornness. I love the way that she like approaches the world Ultimately, like there's the, there's this moment at dinner where like she she kind of synthesizes everything that her story means to her. And it's just like 
it's like they're asking her if she's going to publish and she says no. And, and it's just about like it makes her happy and it's not for anyone else. And and like the way that this like person who's bragging about all their accomplishments and the things that they've done and the way that that hits someone like that. And, and when it comes from a place of purely just like love of story or love of wanting to tell your story, um, I, I'm really happy that that like hit as hard in the show as it did for me in the book. And um, yeah, I mean, her meeting Arthur, all of these things are added the way. Yeah, that- we, we get a new we get a new meeting. It's it's a little different than it plays out in the book. Um, but but it, worked. it was still fun and quirky and, and different. You know, I believed it. And then, yeah, you can see like her realization that her relationship is over and then the the badass moment of just like fucking setting the pool house on yeah. fire. So Danielle Deadweiler, I, yeah, I want to shout her out by name. Incredible job. Um, she, she, yeah, she is an understated performance in some ways. Um, again, there was a ton of uh, really interesting visual things happening. I thought there was a deliberate choice made that basically from the, the moment she's out at the pool house for the first time and Arthur's back at the regular house and they're talking to each other across this span. There's a distance between these two characters that I noticed they basically never like breach. Like they're, they're distant for every scene that follows um, until maybe the like current present day 2020 scenes. But like at the, at the dinner, they're on opposing sides of a long table. And in fact, like Arthur's with these two people very close and she's at the under end of the table with a couple other guests very close. But there's this it strikes me as really bizarre, like yeah. in terms of like setting up a dinner party, right, but you're like- creating physical distance to mimic emotional distance, right? Like that, that that's a visual storytelling choice. And uh, we continue to see that distance playing out because she has been sort of lost in her own world working on this comic. And he hasn't been he doesn't feel like his, you know, needs have been met or whatever. And then, of course, he's Arthur. So he falls in love with people. He's he's easily distracted and he, you know, he's he's fallen for this Elizabeth character. And that's the first time we meet her. And then, of course, uh, uh, Clark is at this dinner party. And we haven't even talked about him yet. Uh, I love I love uh, David Wilmot as 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 Clark. I think he's incredible. He's he's got a, such a dry wit to him, um, but I just really like him. Like he's just a. And it's funny because there's a whole plot line that we get to later where the comparison is made that Arthur everybody just naturally loves him, and for Clark that's never been the case. And I just thought it was funny because I'm like, but I immediately loved him as a viewer. Like I immediately love Clark. I, he's like fantastic so well he's just a great character he gets some of the best lines too like he gets to deliver the when you say it in english you can just say prog and all that stuff look at this dinner party and like sort of blow it off and see like it's not as important as all these people would have would like it to be notably jeevan is absent though and i thought that was an interesting choice i really thought that we were going to see at least like a just a little moment of well they we didn't explore the whole paparazzi thing yet um and, and who knows if we will at all um, the fact that Jeevan was a paparazzi uh, is is something or paparazzo, however you say it. Um, it, it that was a big I think th- it's going to be explored. That was a thing in the book. Yeah, I think it'll be explored because he talks about like he says, um, you know, he talks about his job. He's like, I create content. I'm a journalist. Yeah. I'm this. Actually, I don't have a job. Oh, you know what? It wouldn't surprise me at all if we we're going to get another flashback and we're going to see that he actually did talk to. I would believe it. Yeah, I think it could show up. We just sure. haven't gotten it yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did get that. While we're talking about Miranda, I just wanted to talk about the way that they handled like the tragic story of her life and the way that like art can be so isolating and be so you can become lonely or you can find a community and some 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 people find community. Some people don't want that. But um, how you know, this is her like life's work, this piece of art that she wants to create and how it's isolating her from from loved ones and, and everything like that. But she loves doing it. And then ultimately, like when her love falls apart, she then tortures it and has to start anew. And like just like how bold of a decision that is as a person to make to be like, my whole life is in shambles. I'm going to torture the whole thing, walk away and restart. Oh, man. Be like, yeah, that's it, it hurt me a little bit. It's like so much work just gone, but it's dramatic, you know, and, and I think that the sign is that Arthur is ultimately a big part of that. And so when she's torching it, she's torching her relationship to him. And ultimately, when she finishes the story, clearly she it's important to her to bring it to Arthur and say, like, I did it, even though you didn't think I would ever finish yeah. it. And he is still a part of that. Right. Like we see we see lines that he said, like, I, I think he's the one who says to her, 
And now it's unclear whether or not he's quoting her book, but I don't think he'd read it at this point. But he says, I don't want to live the wrong life and then die. And that is a line that we later see appear in the comic. Um, so, well, and I think Miranda at the end of her life worries that she lived the wrong life. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see multiple characters weighing with this exact question. And so and it's a profound one. And uh, it, yeah. And then speaking of that, just this mini sort of scene and series of scenes that plays out at this conference that she's at and she's with this character, Jim. Oh, poor dumb Jim. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> have you seen Veep? No. So he's like a punching bag in Veep. Like they just tear him apart. His character. That's funny. Um, because he's kind of one here. Like he's he's in he's he's uh he's like in denial. He wants to go golfing. He's like, oh, this will all blow over. Um, and she's like, okay, fine. And then she has this whole plan, right? Where where um her boss has called her and he's got a way for her to get on a ship and she's gonna get out. This is all new. This is all added for the show. Um, and again, like I liked this edition. It gives her something to do. It gives her a dramatic moment where she's trying to sort of in an exciting way escape. And you think maybe she's going to. Um, and then uh, she gets the call and it affects her so much she collapses. Um, and uh, I think she loses something that she needs. Like, the keys. The keys or something. So how harrowing would it have been? Because she, she's told like if she gets on this boat, she's going to be on it for a year. Yeah. That's like. Being trapped on a boat. I mean, you're gonna. All of this is about isolation, right? Like, like quarantining or all that I mean, stuff. Like, no, it's not going to be good anywhere. So, being on a boat, at least you're mobile. I don't know. <laughs> at least there's you can go fishing. Yeah, I just when when he said a year, I was like, oh god, it was a gut punch. Yeah, no, and it, it was a gut punch to her too. You could tell she was like, oh shit. Um, but then she goes back to work basically and her and Jim and like Jim just gives his normal presentation. She at least like gives this, this, like, none of this matters. You don't matter. Why the fuck am I here? What am I doing? You know, I, I missed, I wasn't there the night that my, you know, the love of my life died, which again, I think that is also a slight shift. Um, I don't know that Miranda would have said that Arthur was necessarily the love of her life. Um, I got a lot more of a, that bridge has been burned and um, but it was still a big part of it's a big it was a big part of her life because she says like it's amazing to get a call and and have someone tell you that someone who you planned the rest of your life together is just gone now so clearly it does affect her but not in the way of like oh my god my my long lost love i was going to go to him and i was going to you know rekindle things like i don't think that's the implication of the book and i'm getting a little bit of that in the show um and it's an interesting effect. I, I think it, it, it points everything back towards Arthur and it further sells what Elizabeth says later, that he's a someone who people just all love. And then we see uh, uh, her, her and Jim's awkward hug. <laughs> that was kind of heartwarming um, in how he's like, he has nothing else. This is his whole life. He has no family. Like he has nothing. It's just this. They have a certain understanding though, because both of them are like in this line of work and, clearly find some sort of uh, point in all of it or, or, or did. And now they realize it's pointless, but uh, they share in that at least in the end here. All right. I think it's about time we move to episode four. It's called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern aren't dead. After her run-in with the mysterious stranger, David, Kirsten warns her fellow actor, Alex, to be wary of outsiders as they travel. The man from the Museum of Civilization appears again to request they perform at his community, but Sarah refuses as they never leave the wheel, which are cities surrounding a large lake. Alex finds a note that reads, Beware of the Prophet, and shows Kirsten, who recognizes from a drawing that the Prophet is David, the stranger she encountered earlier. Kirsten convinces Sarah to split the group to visit Ping Tree, which is where the former director of the symphony and Sarah's ex, Gil, lives. When they arrive, they discover the Prophet has already taken all the children of their community. Kirsten recovers her graphic novel, which she hid in Gil's office. Alex leaves after a fight with Kirsten as she flashes back to a similar fight she had as a child with Jeevan in the cabin. The children from Ping Tree return armed with mines strapped to them, killing an unsuspecting Gil and themselves while quoting Station Eleven. Again, just something I really saw coming. This is a change from the book. Um, we we see David Cross <laughs> gets introduced as Gil. So good. Um, yeah, he I does love a David good job. Cross. Yeah, he's a funny guy. So I was a little worried he might be a little bit too humorous. It's hard for me to take him serious. Um, but he did a pretty good job with his with his more dramatic moments here. I thought I bought it. Yeah, when it came to when it came time at the end there, I thought like I really bought it. Like, yeah, he had good performance with especially the moment with Sarah or the the conductor. Yeah. 
the way that they were talking about their relationship and the love that they had. And she kind of calls him out like I wasn't the one who left. Yeah. I thought that was a powerful scene between the two of them. I agree. Um, this is the part I was alluding to earlier, but I really felt the shift of focus on the prophet and his message and his operating sort of MO, <laughs> right? Um, clearly, he is taking in children and telling them basically that they don't need all the people who came from before and that they're the future and that they need to just like everyone who who lived through the pandemic maybe should have died. And you can see how this is dangerous and also appealing. And then we see that all through the character of Alex, who we haven't talked about much, um, who's quite an interesting performance by uh, Ph- Philippine Velge. I'm not probably saying that wrong. Uh, she's she's great. Um, she she is uh, playing this flighty sort of free spirited character who feels a little bit um, like she's going to go wherever the wind blows. And so I bought that she could get taken in by the prophet's message. And, and clearly she was. We, we learn in this episode, like she was ready to leave with him. And all because he came in and told her basically what she wanted to hear. And that's how important she is and how she does. They don't need anyone else. And, you know, the prophet has learned that this message works. And because of that, he's able to start getting these children to come to him. And, uh, you know, that's a little bit different than what we got in the book. But you can you can maybe see that that could have been going on. Um, but again, I, I think you're taking something that maybe was a little bare bones and you're, and you're, you're changing it a little bit and you're tying it more directly into a lot of the themes that you want to explore in this show. Um, so I think that works fantastically. And then, um, yeah, we get a couple of great scenes here. We get Alex running through the minefield, which was like a heart in the throat moment. Um, yeah, so funny and so good. Like that was the first, that was the introduction of David Cross's character yeah. Gil as well. And they're like, stop, we put the mines back in. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh Adam, did you did at any point did you think she was gonna explode? I thought she might, yeah. There was a moment where I thought she might. I was like, this would be so dark. Yeah, I didn't know. Even when she was leaving, yeah. when she was leaving on the horse at the end of the episode, I was like, what if she just goes up right now? Yeah. Uh but she doesn't. And then um we get her performing as Hamlet in this reinterpretation of Hamlet that they throw together on the fly. And they're able to have this scene um where uh her and Kirsten basically have an argument in character. <laughs> uh, I thought that was really well done, right? Um, again, it's like you're taking a lot of lines and you're matching it to the the thematic moment. Um, and yeah, it works really well. The idea of her being the lead instead of Kirsten uh, is is so important to her, and it's a big moment for her. And and Kirsten is clearly jealous, I think, uh, of that and hurt. Um, so. Yeah, I, I, it's a, it's a fascinating dynamic, one that we're still seeing sort of the effects of are going to be playing out, um, and we haven't gotten really what, what what happened after this. Yeah, and other things we get here that is really interesting is we get a lot of these flashbacks to the cabin between her and Jeevan, and um, apparently they, they walked and they, they found some sort of cabin and started living in it for a while together, and um, she talks about how to the monsters were the monsters, that line from Station Eleven comes out, um, we, we learn more about the story, but then we also um, see them having arguments, right? We're repeatedly, we, we touch in on moments of, of uh, conflict, and she's remembering these moments. And again, such a haunted look in our face that it just really sells it for me. Yeah, and I felt like if there's any moment that I didn't really need, it was like the explaining of to the monsters where the monsters, like with the wolves and everything. Like, you know, it was a small thing, but I really felt like it was better left unsaid. Mm just a small thing um, that, but I know they wanted to fill some of those scenes. Well, I, I'm wondering if that's going to lead somewhere more wolf related. That's what I was thinking too. Because like we've, we've heard a few times them talk about wolves and there's wolves out there and stuff like that. There's howling and there's howling. So I, th- so I think it's, I agree that maybe you don't need th- that line explained, but if you're doing it in service of setting up wolves as a threat and a, and a, th- a story thread, we're going to continue to follow. Then I then I'm yeah, more okay true. with it. And I think that's what they're doing. That's my suspicion. Yeah, that's true. I could you know I think it's left for for us to interpret right now. Like, was he taken by a group of people? Was he actually attacked by wolves? Because he leaves the Station Eleven comic with a little bit of blood on it, and behind. we hear howling. And that's at the end of the episode. Um, talk about transition. We see the flash of an explosion of these mines, and then all of a sudden it's it's snow falling on trees, and and we get that. And 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 I wanted to talk a little bit about some of those transitions and 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 the way. And not, it's not even transitions as much as it's like intercutting moments of flashback. And then you have the sound from both 
times overlapping. So like sounds from the past are spilling over into the present. I always am the sucker for that stuff because to me, it really shows how people's past haunt them, right? And in the present moment, you're hearing things and um, the clicking of the lighter is such a dramatic sound that we get throughout and it's tied to the prophet, but we also get it with our uh, Clark uh, is clicking the lighter. And um, there's a lot of this clicking of the lighter thing that, that keeps coming back. Um, but you're really leaning into the strengths of the medium when you do that. Speaking of strengths of the medium, the final scene, well, not the final scene, one of the last scenes where the kids are running around with mines strapped yeah. to their chests and the composer's out playing the piano in the rain, just like so emotionally. Um, the way that the music is playing from the composer with them running around the house and like it was so powerful, so good and uh, so tense. And God, what a fucking crazy scene that was when they, the, the, the kids are- so- The score in this show is fantastic. Oh, amazing. And, and the, the kids are so creepy, like yeah. using ki- kids to be creepy in that way. And the scary cult shit where they're like got fucking minds strapped to them and they're running up and hugging people. Yeah. And they're, they're like, uh, there is no before as they hug Gil, just like the Station Eleven stuff being used for nefarious well, reasons. Well, we talked about that last week, right? Like you, Station Eleven being used by Kirsten in one way and being used by the Prophet in another. Speaking of the Prophet, we're about to learn more about who he is, which I actually think up to this point, they did a really good job concealing. Um, yeah, I think I think it's there's one moment where they're like, um, Miranda's there and she's like, here, give another comic to your son as well. Yeah. And I think if you're like an eagle-eyed viewer, you pick up on the fact that like whoever has the other comic is the... Yeah, but we haven't even met his son yet as a character at that point. We've just heard of him, but then you also know that like this guy's referencing the the creepy guy from episode one or two is like referencing. But you don't know that he survives the apocalypse, so I don't know. I, I, I th- not to say you you couldn't, but they've done a really good job of disguising the idea. The first time we meet the characters in this in episode five, so let's talk about episode five. Well, full disclosure, I was watching with my girlfriend. She figured it out when the comic was handed in like back in episode three or so. Oh, yeah. Before we'd even met the character. Before we met her. Wow. Okay. All right. So episode five, the Severn City Airport. At the outset of the pandemic, Clark is stuck at Severn City Airport with Elizabeth, Arthur's second wife and Tyler, Arthur and Elizabeth's child. Those inside the airport create a settlement while a plane full of travelers is left stranded on the tarmac after potential exposure to the virus. Tyler finds a survivor on the plane who he says has natural immunity, but in the chaos, Miles shoots the survivor. Tyler and Elizabeth are forced to quarantine for a month to ensure they are not exposed, during which Tyler obsessively reads the graphic novel Station Eleven, gifted to him by his father. Clark begins to build the Museum of Civilization. Tyler sets the plane on the tarmac aflame, and Elizabeth, along with everyone else from the community, assumes he perishes inside, but the identity of the prophet is revealed to be Tyler. I mean, I think it's a good reveal. Uh, you know, it, I mean, if, if the clues are there, someone's going to figure it out. That's always going to happen. But I thought they actually did a pretty good job. They also, I, I think, deliberately, Kirsten doesn't can't figure out how old he is, um, which I think also kind of makes it a little bit more like, Hmm. And like in the book, we hear that this the prophet is from the airport. So we already have a lot of hints. And in fact, I think it's probably easier to figure out in the book than it is in the show. Really? I thought, yeah, I mean, I guess I had read the story. I, I thought this was a good reveal. Um, and and it's, it's basically an episode that encapsulates a lot of what I really liked about the later, latter third or so of the book. I said that this was one of my favorite parts of the book was was the community building at the airport. And the sort of fall of society through the lens of this group and Clark and uh, damned if it wasn't even like it was it was still one of my favorite. Like, I, I just absolutely love this. I love I don't know if it was better. I was about to say it was even better on the show, but I don't know. It's really good in both. And they add more. It's there's more of it. Right. There's more characters. We see more plot lines play out. Um but it's it's fantastic. I actually I really liked it, too, here. And I like the idea of this custodian who's got this, who's like faking like his homeland security and is like kind of seize control. Um, Clark's on a bender. And he, even though he starts to like know something's wrong, it takes a little while for him to assert himself and like kind of decide he's going to take part. And I think that's an important moment for him as a character, right? Of like moving on from the past and figuring out what your role is going to be going forward. Um, but then I love that also uh, the moment where he and uh, Miles and Elizabeth are coming up with their plan for how they're going to have control and leadership of the group. 
uh, Tyler's just sitting there learning like everything he can about like lying to people and how how effective it is and how uh, how you can sort of seize control. And uh, unfortunately, he's, he's learning a lot of lessons from them that I think they're unintentional. And I do love how Elizabeth is like, well, we're a triumvirate or whatever. And he's like, yes, yeah, a four. And he keeps like saying that like Tyler's a part of it. Yeah. He's making an effort to like include Tyler and to like take him under his wing a little bit. But it just unfortunately isn't going to work. <laughs> Too damaged. And it, it was so interesting, the idea that Elizabeth tells him that she's been burning the letters that Arthur has been sending. But then she says later that that's a lie. And that I guess Arthur didn't actually keep sending letters. And so it's another, it's like a lie within a lie. She's admitting to a lie, but then there's another lie that she's not admitting to. And she keeps talking about how Tyler can see through when people are lying. Yeah, yeah she's lying to him over and, and over again. And then Clark is like, what are you lying about? And she's like, that Arthur continued to try to be his father, basically. Yeah, man. And, and it's like, that's how you fuck up a kid. I'll tell you that much. So so I, I think that they're, they're laying the groundwork there. And they're honestly, they're doing a pretty good job of selling this, the profits construction here um honestly in a way that maybe is even better than than the book as far as like actually selling us on on this boy becoming this bizarre prophet figure in the book it was more like he was witnessing some things here and there maybe two or three examples well he's he's a simpler character in the book and in fact i think the prophet here is more complex and and uh they've added a different layer with this whole generational thing right and i don't know like i i kind of like what they're doing here with the Profit, and we'll have to see where it goes, but I'm a fan so far. Yeah, you mentioned Clark and the forming of the community. I have to talk about the scene where he reveals to everyone that this like custodian was faking being a Homeland Security officer, and he's like, fuck that guy. And he gives this amazing speech about like community and why like they wanted, they didn't care about us. They thought we were gonna, we were as good as dead, and they've just tripled our, our share of food basically. And um, we're we're going to make a community here. And like, I bought it. I'm like, damn, this is a powerful enough speech to where I can see a lot of people jumping in. And I love that they kept doing like the, the goalie is the important one. Yeah. They left the goalie behind. Like that was funny. Just repeatedly, yeah. like really funny, <laughs> clever moments. Yeah. Uh, absolute batshit crazy moment where somebody's like crawling out of the fucking plane after 10 days. I love that someone yells zombie. <laughs> when they yeah, say Tyler. <laughs> it's so good. Tyler brings him inside and I'm like, they end up quarantining uh, Elizabeth and Tyler after having contact with this guy. But I'm like, unfortunately, that guy co- probably could have just gone and quarantined before you shot him in the oh, head. Oh, yeah, of course. If, but, you know, they shot him in the head. And uh, it's fear, right? Like, I totally buy that something like that could happen. Even though if you stop and think about it, like, he survived longer than anyone else has. It made sense. Yeah, he probably did have some sort of crazy immunity well, and, like, could have quarantined and been okay. statistically, people are going to. Um, they're all, it's always the case. And you know, I, I wanted to... to Mention something. So it bothered me a little bit in the book, and I I never really wrapped my head around it. And I was thinking about it again in in the show. Why the virus isn't present at the airport? Because I was like, how how is it that this airport with hundreds of people, nobody's sick? How why does it not spread here? And I started thinking about it. And I could sort of come up with a w- roundabout way that maybe it could have happened. It would require that everybody who works at this airport wasn't infected which I can just buy because it's in Michigan. It's out of the way. They very deliberately didn't make it LAX or, 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 or uh, LaGuardia or something like that because it's out of the way, small airport. And um, they are rerouting all these flights that are long, like multi-hour flights that are in the air right now. And if it's fast moving enough, they could pro- theoretically could find out from all these flights which ones don't have any sick people on them. Um, and maybe they they basically are judging that, and then they're saying like, if you have no sick people on your flight, then we're gonna reroute you to this to this airport. And so all the flights that arrive there are sort of like these capsules full of people. And if they were, and if it's fast moving enough and, and deadly enough, somebody would have shown up being sick at some point. And if nobody has, like, oh my gosh, all these people are actually okay. You send them all to one place. Um, I could see that maybe happening. They don't actually talk about it, but I'm like, that's the only way I can sell it in my mind because otherwise, like, somebody would be here would be sick. Even then, it's a stretch because there's a lot of things that have to go just right and you can't, you know, and anyway. Um, and then I do like that one flight showed up maybe because they maybe they thought no one was going to be sick on it, but by the time they arrived, it was like, oh, actually, some people are sick on it. Um, and maybe that's why there's the one flight that, that ends up getting quarantined on the tarmac. Yeah, uh, one thing that I was, you know, I've wrapped my head around it at this point, but, like, it, it, just to mention it, the idea that like this pandemic is so f- 
fast moving. This virus is so fast and you're like dead within 10 hours of exposure or something like that. As far as it being this deadly, we've I think we may have even talked about this on the stand. Like it would burn itself out before it was able to completely eradicate the population. It could be this deadly, but it would need to be asymptomatic and contagious for a longer period of time. If it was asymptomatic and contagious for like three or four days and then you drop dead, ooh, that's going to be really deadly because you're going to have a lot of people spreading it in fear as they're fleeing, but actually getting people sick who don't know that they're sick, who go on to spread it to more people who don't know they're sick and so on and so forth. So that would be the way it's kind of it's a little bit maybe pushing credibility that it could that it could strike so quickly and happen so fast and everyone could get well, it. This is like, yeah, this is like a day within a day. It's all. Yeah, gone, it's basically. it's very, very, very fast. I'm not I'm not an expert, so I don't know. Maybe this could happen. I, I, I don't know. Right. But moving on. Uh, one other thing that we got to talk about is just when Tyler and Elizabeth are actually put into the plane and they're like at first they're like a week or something like that, two weeks, whatever it was. And then they're like, you need to go in there for a month. And it was like, oh, shit, they're going to be in a little tube for a month. And like how you can buy the fact that like a little kid having just seen someone die, reading this comic book, like memorizing all the lines and all the stuff that he's been through, like it, he could, he could go, you know, go off the deep end. It was interesting when he comes out and they tell him to put the masks on, which I felt like is a very COVID moment, right? Like you got to wear these masks. I felt like that was, that was deliberate. And then, and then. Well, like I'm sure the the actors just continued to wear their masks like off screen and then walked onto the set and they're like, all right, this is the mask scene. But I thought it was telling that Tyler looks at her and says, "Uh, I told you so. So clearly they've had some sort of conversation where he predicted that they weren't going to trust that they were okay. And I think that's that somehow confirms something for Tyler. Right. Um, And and feeds into his new worldview. I do. I do want to shout out the the narrative um, construction of talking to ghosts through the radio and how I totally bought this would be an idea that someone like Tyler would have and that the kids would latch on to. And then I love that Clark at first is very dismissive of it, but then he finds himself trying it right, trying to talk to Arthur through the radio Um, and then. Eh, kind of a cliche a little bit for it to, oh, it's actually broadcasting and someone's hearing it. But I, I was okay with it because it felt novel enough. And I, and I liked, again, I liked this confessional uh, uh, speaking to the dead. And it actually does feel like this would be a powerful thing. I, it reminded me of, I watched, a, um, I think it's in the, the one of the latest Unsolved Mystery seasons on Netflix. There's an episode about the tsunamis. Uh, in Japan, uh, the tsunami that happened in Japan and the ghosts of, you know, uh, those who died, whether or not you believe in that, um, that's what the episode's about. And one of the things they talk about, I think it was there, is they talk about how there's these phone booths now in the area where people go. And the idea is that you can pick up the phone and leave a message for someone who died in the aftermath of the of this uh, of this tsunami. And uh, it, it reminded me of that, right? Like there is something cathartic about leaving a message for the dead whether or not it ever reaches them and so i actually really liked that addition and i think um i wonder if it will be implemented in the future in some way if it'll come back i'd be really curious there's also another moment that i wonder might come back and this isn't a book spoiler because this this line doesn't exist in the book um but i think it's miles who says to him no it's not miles one of the women i can't remember somebody says to says to clark would you die for a stranger? And then he looks at her and he has like a moment of thought and he says, probably not. And I thought, this is going to come back. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to see. That would be a change because, again, that line doesn't happen in the book. Um, so I'm curious to see if, if that line comes back in some sort of thematic way. And I'm going to be paying attention to that. Yeah, I have a feeling it will. I'm with you. Um, well, last person I want to talk about is Brian, who is the character that keeps showing up with the symphony and saying, like, come to the Museum of Civilization. The Museum of Civilization, yeah. And they keep telling him, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Interesting character. Cool to think that, like, there's, like, an advocate. Like, somebody clearly is there during all of the plane stuff, leaves and gets out to the greater world and is finding people to come to the civilization, to the Museum of Civilization. Yeah, you may not have put that all together if you watch it, because I do think they do a good job of disguising him. But um, yeah, I mean, that is him. And that's the implication, right? You hear him talk about how I want to make a museum. So you probably at that point start to realize this has got to be the museum we've heard about later. Yeah. Right. Oh, you're, well, like, yeah, at the end of the episode, you very clearly Clark see says I'm going to make a museum. Mm-hmm. Making a museum. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. I'm, I'm so excited to watch the rest of this series, man. Um, I am I am very positive on it right now. Loving it. Uh, they got to stick the landing and uh, yeah. we, will, we will see. Well, and that's one thing to bring up is how 
we've kind of burned through most of the book at this point. So I think we're going to get a lot of stuff that isn't from the book going forward. And I'm excited to see where that goes. Yeah, I, there is some stuff I can think of that we haven't gotten to yet. But yeah, I mean, I, mean, I agree. Um, and we're going to have some dramatic moments going forward. If you haven't watched and if you haven't read and you haven't watched. Um, yeah, stay tuned. Buckle in. It's going to be an exciting finish, I think. And I can't wait, man. I, I'm I'm into this one. And I, you know what? I predict right now it is going to be a difficult decision for me. Um, if this show goes as well as I, I think it's going. And I, I raved about this book last week. Um, I think this is going to be a tough call when it comes time to decide because I am quite taken with this thing and how they're able to, to pull it off. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to be squirming. <laughs> Drawing a comparison to Leftovers for me is like very high praise. Very. And um, I, I'm really excited to see if it continues to stick that landing because so far it's it's up there for me. Well, if you enjoyed our coverage and you enjoyed us talking about all these episodes and comparing it to the book and doing our unique uh, sort of spin on this kind of thing, uh, let us know and let us know in the form of a rating and review if you haven't left one already for our show. Um, whatever app you chose to listen on, we'd appreciate to see it. Um, it helps us get the word out, boost our numbers and, and get more eyes on our show, which is, uh, as I said last week, kind of small and scrappy. And that's the way I like to think of us. Like we're, 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 you know, doing OK, but we we really could benefit from people spreading the good word <laughs> of Ink to Film. Um, we, we appreciate it if you do that for us. Yeah. And make sure to spread the word also on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. All of those at Ink to Film. And if you'd like to support us in another way, we do have a Patreon where we do uh, adaptation adjacent and other adaptations from different years for your favorite books that we've covered so far. Um, we just recently did the 2013 version of Carrie. Uh, we had already covered the 70s version uh, just you know, a little while ago on the show, but we wanted to go watch that new one. Had a lot to talk about there, a lot to break down in the ways that it was modernized and changed. Uh, had a lot of fun talking with you about that and uh that episode should be out now so definitely check that out and thank you to ross bugden for the use of our intro and outro music all right man that's it uh we are hoping to have a guest on next week but uh stay tuned uh once we confirm that that's going to happen then you'll see the announcement officially and and everything will be will be uh will be available to you uh should be a fun way to close out the show and uh we hope you join us and until next time keep adapting keep adapting